This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosts an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. Working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. As we welcome our viewers to This Week in Richmond, we have a very special guest and a welcome to Delegate Kirk Cox, Colonial Heights and part of Chesterfield, and the majority leader in the House of Delegates. We thank you so much for being back with us. It's been too long, and ah. now that the session has ended and we have some time to have conversation, because you were, as always, extremely busy during the session, we'd like for you to tell our viewers about some of the major issues of this past session, and then if time permits, we'll even ask you to speculate some about the one coming up next year. Well, David, it's great to be with you. There were four or five issues that dominated the session. Your viewers have heard a lot of them. Transportation probably has to be mm -hmm. number one. It was interesting that you mentioned uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has sort of ranked Virginia number one for business. If you look, we'd started to slip in some of those rankings. Yes. We'd gone down to three on some. We'd all, always been one or two. Generally, what was named was transportation, that our infrastructure was problematic, especially in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. If you look at Hampton Roads with the port generating so much traffic and the widening of the Panama Canal is anticipated will do even better. Northern Virginia, which I think was ranked the number one congested area in the United States. I think it was. <laughs> so hopefully the transportation bill, which generates both a statewide piece and particularly some money for Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads, will help us with that one piece. We've gotten a very good reaction. It was a balanced plan, in my view, between some general fund, which is just the tax money everybody pays, and also does raise additional revenue, but it is for a core function of government. So that was big. Everyone's heard a lot about that. Sure, yes. Uh, the other big one that maybe your viewers have not heard quite as much about was K-12, which I was very pleased. The government had a very comprehensive package. I just retired as a school teacher after 30 years. And one of the things as the co-chair of the governor's commission I wanted to see was an emphasis on teachers. If you look at the number one ranked country in the world in education, it's Finland, believe it or not. Hmm. Everybody goes, Finland, what does Finland do that's so great? And really, it's they have the best teachers. So there are two ways you can do that. One, you do have to pay them better. Uh, I did it for 30 years, and teachers you, you are know, You know how poor the pay and, is. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting, and I'll mention one thing we did. We gave teachers an across-the-board pay raise. Now, they're local employees, so we simply give some incentive money that the localities have to match it. But we also put about $7.5 million into something called strategic compensation. It's a pilot program. The localities can tap into Salem City Schools at Southwest Virginia have modeled the program. Their teachers developed it. And it's not merit pay, because if you say the word merit pay to teachers, they all jump out the window. They immediately conjure up SOL testing and that will be the only thing mm -hmm. they're based on. The business community, though, does want to see some type of merit-based pay. So what strategic compensation does, which I love, it works on student growth. So for example, I have Susie in class. She's at the 30th percentile, let's say, in a pretest in my class. You have Johnny. He's at the 80th percentile. Well, Johnny's going to pass the SOL test, no matter whether you're terrible mm -hmm. and I'm good. Sure. Susie's going to struggle. Even if I can get her to the 50th percentile, she might pass. 
but this new merit-based system ranks teachers on student growth. So if I can get Susie's from 30 to 50, I can get compensated on that. And it's got a lot of other factors like mentoring teachers, working in hard to staff schools, and localities can tailor the program to sort of what they see as important. So teachers are fairly excited about this. It passed both houses. So that's the type of K-12 reform for pay. We did a lot of other things besides that that I'm really intrigued by. So you say that was pretty much modeled after what they were doing in Salem? Salem has been working on this for two years. They gave several teachers a leave from the classroom and they ran models all over the United States. They sat down with mm. their teachers and said, okay, this is what we're coming up with. What do y'all think? And they tweak various models, but it rewards you for things that we all know good teachers do. Really good contact with parents. They had an innovative program to constantly be calling parents. And not only talking about teachers, sometimes we get in this rut. We call when your kid's not doing well. Well, how about calling when your kid does do well? Mm. And that mm. sounds obvious, but mm. it's really an encouragement. So those types of things are rewarded. It's a point system. So uh, you can get up to $5,000 per teacher until the money runs out. And a locality has to choose to participate. But I'm really intrigued by it. It's $7.5 million, which means it's enough money. We can really test it. If it works, I'm hoping it's the wave of the future. Excellent. So that, that money is in the in the budget first year or second year or, or both? Or? Yeah, that money's in uh, the 2014 budget. Mm -hmm. So okay. it'll be in there for this coming school year. So I'm pleased. Uh, that will be interesting. And we did a lot of other things. I had a bill called Teach for America. And that's a program that a lot of other states have, have run for years. And this is interesting in that it goes and recruits third and fourth year college students who might not have shown that teaching is what they want to do, but they're very bright. They're in the top 5% of their class. They are your student body presidents, the RA in the dorm. They've shown some leadership and they go, would you like to apply for Teach for America if you ever thought of a teaching career? And some of them do it. They're highly motivated. They will be assigned to a hard to staff school if they make it. So a school from a rural area or an inner city that struggles. And generally a, a subject where they're having trouble finding teachers. The catch is, and the reason why we don't have Teach for America in Virginia, is they don't go through the traditional education program because you're recruiting them in their senior year. They go through intensive training. And right now, we have around 200 Virginia graduates that are teaching in other states, in other places like New Orleans or in South Carolina, but they're not teaching in Virginia. So that passed, and I'm excited about that. I think it will help some of the schools that are struggling with those hard to staff positions. You know, it's interesting. I was in Southwest Virginia this past week and a top graduate at a small liberal arts college there in Southwest Virginia, her choice is to do Teach America and she will be in North Carolina and in the mountains of North Carolina and she was just excited about about that opportunity and and she was the top student in the graduating class. So it's it it, to me, it indicated that it was not just picking up ones that, well, what am I going to do to find a job, but really, as you said, got, got well, some I think you explained it better students. than I did, because the key is when we look at Finland, what Finland does, and going back to them for a second, they get the top 5 or 10% of our graduates. We get a lot of good teachers, but if you look at the ranking, the average teacher ranks around the 50th percentile in college. So as you say, these are people that have shown some leadership position in college, they've shown the academic skill, they're on fire generally, those are the kind of motivated kids that you have, and I'm really excited about what they can do. About a third of them stay in teaching, about two-thirds of, two -thirds of them stay in some form of education. And what advocates for education on the road even if they don't stay in education? Exciting program. So, so is that one then slated also to take effect? Uh, that will actually take effect July 1. Mm -hmm. So, you know, actually, hopefully we can ramp that program up and get that program going as of this current school year. So that will be for, and you really hit on it. It will be mainly rural schools in southwest Virginia, not North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It will also be some of the uh, schools that are struggling in the inner city. And especially they have trouble with math teachers, science teachers, uh, even a music teacher, let's say, for example. Those are hard to recruit sometimes if you're in rural southwest Virginia. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, some people fear it would take teacher jobs. But generally, these are hard to staff schools, and you focus on the subject areas that school is struggling with. So one school might be struggling with math teachers, one music teacher, so you can move the teachers around. Well, and, and I, happen to, I happen to know this youngster. I'll not 
give her a name, but I think if she really enjoys doing it, she'll be one who'll go back and get her master's. I mean, she'll she'll get even some other specialty in teaching if she if she discovers after two years that she loves working in a hard to teach setting such as that. So, and I started in a hard to staff setting. It was very rewarding, and you need people to go into those situations that are enthusiastic, that are going to change the world. That's what you want. Well, that's uh, that's some other uh, good progress that was made in, in education then. It was. Yeah, very, very excited uh, about some of the other things that were done, uh, a whole host of bills. One will be interesting, and that's grading schools A through F. Mm. And currently, schools are accredited and they're accredited with warning and they have various accreditation. The complaint about that is what does accredited with warning mean? Does that mean I'm a C? Does that mean I'm a D? Does that mean I'm a C plus? So A through F is a concept some other states have tried and that grade school like by a system we all understand. Some schools don't like that. Uh, they feel like that maybe that's a little too simplistic of a model. I do like it. Uh, you've been around here a long time like I've been around here, and we get graded by lobbyist groups all the time, which mm -hmm. I sort of laugh. Mm -hmm. I think the DEA even grades as A, B, C, D, and F. So does the National Rifle Association, the Sierra Club. So everyone's used to that terminology. The theory is if your school is a C, parents will be much more curious, why are we a C? What does a C mean? If you're credited with DASH, what does that mean? So hopefully it's a little bit more transparent system. And that hopefully your grade will be more based on student growth in the future, just not SOL tests. So that's something else we're trying to build into the model. So that'll be an interesting concept. The last one was something called Opportunity School Districts, which was uh, hotly debated. What do you do with a school, school, not a district, what do you do with an individual school that maybe has not gotten accreditation for several years? Do you just keep allowing them to fail? Uh, or do you do something more radical? And the Opportunity School District is something that's been tried in some other states where there's actually a state school board that takes over the school, they can turn into a charter school, they can bring in turnaround specialists. It's a much more radical approach. Two schools of thought, some people don't like it because they go the local school board should be in control. Other people say it's a good idea because these schools have chronically failed for a long time. There are really only four schools that really fit that fairly tight criteria. Now some could fit it in the future. So that was an interesting debate on what to do with those particular schools. So, so in those instances, then as this moves forward, it would take over the individual schools or the school district in which the just school is? Just the school. So if you have, uh, let's say you have a high school, a middle school, and four elementary schools. Let's say your middle school is the only one that is not accredited. The only one they would take over would be your middle school. And so, and like they would, they would make an analysis of it. The teachers could reapply to the school. They could rehire them or not. And they could basically look at making it a laboratory school where you work with a college. That's a lab school. They could look at making it a charter school uh, through a private charter organization or a more public charter organization. They could look at just reconstituting the school. But they would basically bring in the specialist and make the determinations. And so it's a much, and, and the theory is, and it's a, it's a very controversial question, the theory is that that's, this school has failed not for one year. This, this school has chronically failed not to get accreditation. So that's the, the theory, and it did pass. Uh, there's some money in the budget for it, so that will be uh, something that will be up and running fairly soon. The other education bills you talked about, I think all kick in July 1, this school year. Is, is this one now that has a bit of a delay? Does it, does it really affect the 2000? Uh, 14 or 15 year or which? Yeah, that's more of a delay and obviously, you know, the way that one will work, uh, I'm not sure whether it's 15 or 16, but it'll be, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit later than the others. You know, before we were getting mic'd up and starting the show, I'd mentioned that some recent news that one school division, I think looking at some possibility of year-round school, with your background in education and also your involvement with it here at the state level. Uh, any perspectives on, on how that works? Are you, is that what's done in Finland or is that what's done in some other countries? Or? Interesting, my brother who's superintendent of Colonial Heights actually came from a year-round district in California. Hmm. And I think Petersburg was looking at it and I, mm -hmm. I started in Petersburg. Uh, 
it's an interesting concept. JLARC, our Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission, which is sort of our watchdog and our study commission, mm -hmm. did a study of year-round schools. And the jury's out. It, it has mixed results. It does tend, it looks like the research tells you if you are more of a school that struggles with accreditation, that's really struggling, it has much more merit than if you're just a, you know, you're a C or B school. And I know a lot of the city schools or city systems would like for us to offer some incentive money for year-round schools. The advantage of a year-round school is, if you do it correctly, that you could offer what I call intercessions. And so, for example, let's say, for example, that you, know, you go to a nine-week block, and then you know, for three weeks you could do an intercession where you could give enrichment or help catch kids up. It would help as far as if a kid does badly, one section, you can immediately take that other section. It gives you more flexibility, obviously. If it's uh, academically based, it's got some real merit if you have intense intersections, if you, your remediation is geared to the year-round school. I think it just depends on the model you put in and the commitment. I don't think that's going to change your school system by itself. But maybe for a school that's struggling, some of the research says it has some possibilities. So it's certainly something that should be looked at. You know, Chesterfield looked at it years ago mm. uh, and didn't go with it because there's some logistical problems with year round schools, especially for a big system. Woody, I have four boys, for example, so, and they're all at different levels. So what happens if, you know, uh, they all four play sports and you're trying to, you know, do some of the non-academic things and make them work? There's some logistical things to work at, but there's also some really uh, interesting things you can do with your own school. Yeah, so it sounds like it would make a good pilot. Uh, it, and I think that's what it yeah, should be. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I, the research does seem to show that a school system that's struggling more would be a good pilot. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want to go to a state model, but, you know, mm -hmm. it might be interesting to do a pilot with a school system like a Petersburg or Norfolk, or even a, a Galax, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, anything else in education, or shall we? Uh, we'll move on to something move, else, because I've probably beaten uh, that. Uh, no, I think it's a great deal, good, great deal of good information that you provided on education. For several years now, I've been the, uh, involved in house appropriations. Um, as the number two person there to Lacey Putney, who's not running again, who's retiring after his 50 plus years in the General Assembly. Um, with the prospects that you might be moving into uh, more of the chairmanship on that, do you, what, what challenges do you see going forward thinking about the budget here in Virginia? Do you see it in, on good even keel or is it is it the national scene that's going to affect next fall and next session when you're working on the budget? Well, well it's interesting. As far as my role goes, uh, being majority leader, generally we don't chair a committee, so I, obviously I need to make some decisions there. But as far as appropriations goes, uh, we'll miss Lacey tremendously. Uh, as you know, you have a great relationship with him. He has been there longer than any state legislator I understand the United States. And that's yes. a, came yes. in with John Kennedy. So that's a long time, yes, and he's is. sort of been our leader, so that will be a someone who will really be missed. I really like the way our process works now, and that the process needs to continue. We actually, in the Appropriations Committee, bring every Republican, every Democrat upstairs to the ninth floor where the Budget Committee meets, and we run them through the budget and tell them what we're thinking about doing and get their input. And that's why we've had such unanimous, not unanimous, but out mm -hmm. of the committee we've had unanimous right. votes and we've had good votes on the floor. We're at 2007 spending levels, so we've tried to be very, very prudent as far as the budget goes. But we're, we are really affected by the federal government. Sequestration, which there's been a heavy debate about. I mean, is it really gonna have the effect, the president said? Uh, I don't think it will, but maybe in Virginia it will. Because mm -hmm. we're such a military dependent state. Mm -hmm. Northern Virginia has so many, even private contractors, which are dependent. So we will see some effects from sequestration. That will affect our budget coming out. Uh, the economy, though, is sort of, you know, moping along, not terrible, not great. But we've really tried the last three or four years not to start new programs, uh, to really go with programs that we know work and that do not build the base of the budget. We've tried to unwind any gimmicks we have. We're trying to fund the Virginia retirement system much better than we have in the past because that's something states are going to struggle with, like California and Illinois. We are trying to get money into the classroom. 
I mentioned strategic compensation, some other things. But for example, we found out that we have ratios for all instructional personnel. You have like, let's say for example, you might have a ratio of 22 kids for every kindergarten teacher. There were no ratios for non-instructional personnel. So we were actually mm -hmm. seeing greater growth. Mm -hmm. We put a cap of four instructional for every one non-instructional. Saved us about $700 million over the last three or four years. So we're trying not just to cut, we're trying to put money where it is, it is needed. But it'll be interesting. The next biennial budget will be come out. Governor McDonald will submit it, and uh, he's got some. He'll have some tough decisions to make about where he wants to go forward. You know, um, our viewers will know if they're following the news something that just came out over the weekend that, uh, as the governor signed the budget, he did one line item veto, and and that had to do with the the way governor's amendments are are submitted, and. While, while my understanding was this, if it had stayed in the budget, it, it's only law as long as this budget's in effect. So I don't know that it would have, uh, would, it, would, it, would it have affected future governors or, uh, you have any perspective on that? I don't, I don't want to put you in a broad no, patch, not, but. No, that's, that's what our job's all about. The theory was this, uh, and it really was only for the short session. We have a two year budget, sort of only right. affected the amendments, the governor's amendments to the budget. And what the governor does is, after the first year of the budget, he amends the budget, but he sends us a document. And you've got to sort of figure out where the yes. amendments are. When the governor then might decide, for example, well, I left out four or five things, or four or five things I want to add, he sends us what we call half sheets down here. And that's just nothing more than a sheet this big that has a summary mm -hmm. and a dollar amount of that budget item. We look at that separately. Our theory was, members of the General Assembly put in half sheets if we want to do a budget amendment. And that budget amendment's considered all by itself. It's not considered with a block of things. It just, it was, it was basically putting the governor on an even playing field with the legislature because the budgetary responsibility has historically been obviously somewhat the General Assembly's. So the theory was then that that would uh, sort of equal up the executive and legislative branch. It would not, it would affect the next governor. The governor felt like if I was governor, I'd have probably felt the same way, but I'm in the legislative branch. They felt like that that obviously trimmed the governor's power some. He felt like I disagree with this, uh, and I agree with him on most everything. He's, I think, a tremendous governor. But, and I think any governor, whether it been Mark Warner or Tim Kaine, would have agreed with him. He felt like that, you know, when you send the whole document down, if you've done half sheets, then when the bill hit the floor, members might not have known really what the governor was proposing. Only the appropriation members would have had a chance to really critique what the governor was doing. So he had his reasons. We weren't surprised, frankly. Uh, right. So, But that's something that is going to be probably a give and take over the next few years. We didn't on purpose mess, mess with his ability to do the biennial budget. Right. So it was just more or less a tweak. Right. Uh, we, I kiddingly talked to him about it, and uh, it wasn't a surprise that a governor would try to preserve his powers and we try to enhance right. our powers. It, it was interesting that on both sides of the discussion, or argument if you want to call it that, it was about transparency, and each side saying it would be more transparent, but the other would be less. And and, and they're probably somewhat right. For us, the half sheet's easy. You can oh, read yeah. it. Yeah. It makes sense. The governor would argue it was transparency for the Appropriations Committee, but would not be transparent for the other members who might not s never see any some of his amendments at the floor and not have a chance to vote on those. Yes. So I guess you could argue both yes. ways. And that's so, what we do down here. <laughs> so that was done. So that's that has been changed. And the rest of the budget is intact as it was approved back at the reconvene day. The governor had a pretty good reconvene session. Most of his amendments were approved. Uh, he did some very smart tweaks. For example, he put a little bit of money in strategic compensation more than we had, which I liked. Mm -hmm. And so he went from like five million to seven point five million. So those are the kind of tweaks you see in, right. in the budget. So well in our closing minute some <clears throat> excuse me, in our closing minute that we have, something else that uh, you'd like to mention to our viewers, any other subject that I'd left out? Well, I had a really unique opportunity. I got to go with the governor to California as part of his trade trip. Oh, excellent. And that was really interesting very quickly because we got to visit with a lot of the studios. Mm -hmm. uh, he had lunch with Steven Spielberg, but of course the Lincoln film was mm -hmm. done here. 
And it was interesting to go see how a governor recruits business. And he was everywhere. He was with the wine industry, he was with the film industry, he was with business. And so it was really interesting perspective to look at some of the incentives, and they're fairly modest. We put out there and see how our governor uses those to try to close a deal. And you might have noticed that recently uh, National Geographic said they're going to do the Killing Kennedy series. Yes. And we closed that deal on the trip with the governor, so that was fun, different. Excellent, excellent. excellent. Well, Delegate Kirk Cox, thank you so much for being with, with us and, and explaining to our viewers on these issues. and. We look forward to future conversations with you and uh, after you worked it out, whether you're majority leader or chair of, of, of appropriations, uh, we look forward to working with you. Thanks, David. Thank Good you. to be with you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosts an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. Working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.